And welcome back, Tactical Buddies, to another Gutter Fighting Secrets Tactical Podcast. Today, we are joined by United States Marine Corps Staff Sergeant Blake Flannery. Now, Blake is a Recon Marine, Special Tactics Branch, 2nd Marine Expeditionary Force, um, Expeditionary Operations Training Group, and um, he is a instructor, primary instructor of uh, CQB Close Quarters Battle Specialized Raids. Um, he uh, visits uh, visit board and search and seizure, so I'm assuming that that's like maritime type of operations and um, really cool guy stuff like that. We are freaking honored to have you on, Blake. Thank you so much for agreeing to join us and coming on and giving us some of your expertise here. So welcome onto the podcast. Yeah, no worries. Good to be here. Glad to help. Uh, hopefully, spread some knowledge. Absolutely, man. So I'm looking at your resume here, and uh, besides from um, from you know doing all of this crazy stuff with like Marine Recon, you actually have had multiple deployments to Iraq in Operation Enduring Freedom. You've been to the Republic of Georgia Pacific Command. Um, it's been a long and seasoned career for you, brother. Yeah, it's been a pretty wild ride. Um, but uh, through it all, though, you know, it's been, despite how frustrating it can get sometimes, it's still been very much worthwhile. You joined in July of 2001, which means pretty quickly after 9-11 happened. How much was that a determining factor in you joining the Marines? Uh, well, so, you know, I joined before the actual events. I... Uh, it was something I always wanted to do. I was that uh, crazy little kid running around the neighborhood in camouflage with, you know, the Rambo set 2019 <laughs> um, things like that. I kind of strayed from that and got into sports for a while. Um, but I, I circled back around to wanting to be in the military. I dragged my mom or made her take me to the recruiter's office when I was 15. Um, and they very politely told me to go away. Uh, I went back a week prior to my 17th birthday and I was like, I'm going to be, be back in a week. I want you to have the paperwork ready when I walk back in. <laughs> um, they didn't believe me because, you know, they get a lot of kids that come in, talk tough and then never show up again. And then I came back, I think it was the day after my 17th birthday. And I was like, so where's the paperwork, man? What's up? Um, it was just something I always wanted to do. Uh, so when 9-11 happened, I was actually in boot camp in wow. Paris Island. Wow. Now, I did get my math a little bit wrong on that, but um, if it were the other shoe on the other foot, do you think you still would have joined knowing that you'd be going to war? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, it was actually interesting. So when it happened, you know, in boot camp, it's a very controlled environment. They uh, – you don't really know what's going on in the outside world. And mm -hmm. it can like, it can be a pretty big culture shock for just about everybody. Um, and a lot of the other guys, in my platoon, a lot of the other recruits didn't think it was real. They mm -hmm. thought it was something that was made up to put us in a combat mindset. Uh, and we really didn't have a lot of information. Um, we were on the rifle range portion. We were in our marksmanship phase and uh, we were outside doing some dry practice and we just knew something was going on. The, the drone instructor's attitude changed, but we just figured someone like really messed up mm. and was in a lot of trouble. We went inside and the uh, primary marksmanship instructor mentioned something about us being bombed, but that didn't really make a whole lot of sense. So it, it took a few days for, um, People started receiving uh, letters from home in the mail. Um, guys were receiving newspaper clippings and that um, the article of Time Magazine where they had the towers burning on the cover. Mm -hmm. um, and then people are like, okay, this is, this is real. This isn't some scenario. Like, this is real. This happened. And holy shit. Um, a lot of guys were really nervous because they – they joined thinking it was peacetime. Yeah. Um, and now they were confronted with like, they are going to very likely have to go to war. Uh, 
I was excited. Um, <laughs> just kind of why I joined is probably not the right response. Um, but I just, I don't know, to me, it was like I could, you know, be uh, really test my mettle and be uh, baptized in fire kind of a thing. I think that that's what all Marines ultimately really want, especially in boot, after boot camp. It seems to me like from everybody I've talked to, they really hype you up and they get you really wanting to just kill, kill, kill the whole time you're there. And for a Marine to be able to go overseas afterwards is, you know, I mean, like it or not, that's what you guys do. And I think that you really, I mean, like you said, you, you, you guys all received your baptism of fire and I can't imagine what that was like, but I do give you guys freaking all the props in the world because that's some nasty stuff. Um, what was it like after you graduated from boot camp? Um, how long until you actually went over to Iraq uh, was it? Uh, so I finished boot camp uh, fall of 01. I uh, did my basic infantry training uh, here in Camp Lejeune. And then uh, was it? February, February 2002, or excuse me, 2003, um, we deployed to Kuwait. Mm. Um, so, you know, troops went into Afghanistan starting October, and we basically rolled over the Taliban. Um, so by the time I got to the fleet on the West Coast, we were like, ah, crap, like, we missed the war. Mm. Um, so we just started doing our normal training. Um, every Marine unit trains up uh, at some point to deploy in a Marine exhibition unit. So, you know, fifth Marines were no different Just start doing our normal MU workup. And, uh, we went on leave for pre-deployment coincided with the holidays, which was nice. And I got back, uh, a day or two before the, the actual leave block ended. And some of the guys who were kept back because they got in trouble were like, Hey man, we're going to go get our gear back in a couple of days. Like we're going back to the issue facility to get our gear. Cause we're going to Kuwait. They're talking about going to Iraq. I'm like, no way, dude. No, no way. But then, yeah, everyone came back from leave, had company formation. They're like, uh, yeah, this is what's going on. So we're going to go get our gear. We've got a few more weeks to prepare and we're going to be flying to Kuwait, you know, by early February, which we did, I think it was like February 5th. Mm. Uh, we landed in Kuwait. Something like that. So what is it like? Um, and can you give us <clears throat> a little bit of maybe mindset advice here? Because I know, you know, guys leading up to a situation where they might have to see combat, and they're not sure, but there's a lot of kind of anxiety about it. What are some ways for guys to kind of maybe quiet their mind, still their mind, and just go for it and do what they need to do? So – one of the first things is guys have to understand and you know, everyone who serves has to understand that there's always a possibility they could end up deployed, you know, in combat. Um, you know, we didn't think we were going, we thought we were going to go in the 31st mute to Okinawa and we came off leave and bam, we are suddenly planning to invade a foreign nation. Um, and that's happened multiple times. There were been plenty of, units that have stood up and be like, all right, we're just going to go out on a mew and we're we float around, you know, in the Pacific ocean or the Indian ocean. And then you end up in country. Um, so it can happen at kind of at any, almost at any moment. So people need to prepare themselves for that reality. There's a little bit too much of, Oh, I don't think I'm going to go to combat because there is not a specific and active theater where everyone's deploying to like we were for so many years. Um, once you come to terms with that, you start preparing yourself for that eventuality. Uh, you just naturally steal your mind to the possibilities. Uh, ultimately, there's not, there's not really anything that you can truly do. You don't know how you're going to really perform in that environment until you're in it. Uh, for the leadership, one of the best things to do is force on force, what we call force on force training. Um, so you can do blanks. Blanks is okay because it's loud and it kind of gets some of that auditory sensory overload for the guys to work through with communication. But uh, using uh, simulation rounds, uh, we do that pretty often. 
So there's actually a projectile coming after you and, you know, there's input when you get hit. Uh, so that helps prepare people and then combatives training, mm. um, you know, training people up. We have the Marine Corps martial arts program. Uh, some of us out there use a special operation, uh, special operations combatives program, uh, but train your combatives and then, you know, put some pads on and have at it, you know, grapple, hit each other, wrestle each other. Like all that stuff just naturally kind of steals you for what may happen. Now, when we're talking about combatives, and this is obviously what we talk about mostly on Gutter Fighting Secrets is the hand-to-hand portion of things. Um, from what I've heard, the most likely time that you're going to get hand-to-hand with the enemy is either doing CQB or uh, prisoner, like prisoner uh, collection or search or something like that. How often, how likely is it that when you go into a CQB situation, whether that's on a ship or whether that's in one of those little huts over in Afghan or Iraq, um, how likely is it really that you're going to have to transition, you know, from your weapon and, and go hands-on with a guy? Uh, it's pretty much guaranteed. If you go into a building, there's going to be people in there. Um, most of the time, it's pretty tame. You know, it's, uh, you know, you push somebody out of the way, make your move to the spot in the room, you're what we call a point of domination. Uh, clear the room, and then you have to deal with that person. You know, if they did not present themselves as a deadly threat, meaning I didn't shoot them, uh, well, now I have to secure that person because I don't want to keep clearing and some yahoos just walking around behind me. So you're going to have to go hands-on. And uh, you know, it, it usually, it very rarely will turn into a like fight with the individual, but if you don't know how to do a proper arm bar and a proper takedown or a wall pin, uh, you're going to be kind of struggling to place this individual in the position you want them in so that you can put some flex cuffs on them and secure them, which is not only safety for you, but it's safety for the individual. Um, and that's one of the things that we had to start dealing with is it's not just important for me to cuff a military age male or to keep women and children sequestered away somewhere, but it's also important for them. And then that circles back around to being important for the larger goals. Cause if I let them get hurt or I'm the one who causes them to be hurt, I just made a whole bunch more enemy fighters. Mm -hmm. I I just made it a lot more difficult for myself to operate in an area. Um, So yeah, I mean, even just patrolling down a busy street, you know, you turn into a marketplace uh, and you hope you see all the people because if you don't, that's a warning sign for something else. Uh, but they're, not all those people are happy that you're there and they wear that on their sleeve and they want to come up and they want to yell at you and you don't understand their language. Um, so there's a lot that goes into your combatives and it's more than just the ability to put hands on somebody. It's that ability to receive the aggression and not back down and, and shrink away from it, but to mm. hold your ground and be ready because they might decide that they want to hit you and you have to be ready to respond appropriately. I would imagine that going through Marine boot camp would really help that stoicism that you need to have when somebody's yelling in your face overseas. It definitely does. Um, like, between your basic training and boot camp and you know we go from uh the recruit depots on each coast and then also in each coast we have the school of infantry so you get to the school of infantry and your combat instructors are yelling at you not the same way as a drill instructor but like you know you're screwing up loading a machine gun and they're hollering at you for you know why can't you load this machine gun or they're some cases maybe intentionally hollering to induce extra stress on a certain exercise so you're fairly well inoculated to it. Um, but I've seen it where when confronted with whether it be a local or even we've started to contract uh, civilians to come into our training facilities. And so, you know, they, these contractors will bring in like 40 Somalians or 50, you know, Arabic speaking people. Hmm. 
uh, into this training facility. So like you are immersed in it hmm. and they'll be speaking their native language and they're going to be acting, you know, more or less the way that they would or believe that they would in their native country. And according to a script that's been given to them, uh, and I've seen Marines back down, huh. just completely back down. Um, because it's just a slightly different uh, stimulus and sometimes they're just not ready for it. Yeah. It's always, it's always when it's an, like a foreign language or like something you're just so unfamiliar with, I think that really kind of turns that switch in you and makes you want to almost recoil from it. It's yeah, yeah. It, it can be very uncomfortable. Um, you know, especially coming from here and, even in the field conditions that we normally live in for like infantry and most Marines, you know, go to the field and we live out in the field and we sleep in the dirt, but then, you know, it's still, it's like, it's first world. Like this is first world dirt out here. It just seems cleaner than the dirt over there. And, you know, even the dirty people here seem cleaner than the dirty people there. And you're like, they're in your personal space and they smell funny. And it's just like, all right, I just want you out of my face. I don't, uh, so it, it can definitely be awkward. Um, but what I found is that if you are just aggressive, um, and not even aggressive to the point where like, I'm just going to start hitting people, not that kind of aggression, but standing my ground looking like I'm like, give that person look like I'm going to hit you. I'm going to hurt you. Um, moving through them instead of trying to go around them in a crowd. Uh, you can very quickly send the appropriate signals like I am not to be trifled with. Yeah, I think that especially in the, you know, the Iraqi culture and everything, it's power and, you know, um, authority is something that they really respect. And, uh, you know, that's a great point that you make about going through them and displaying that dominance, displaying that power. Um, I mean, after all, you're in the United States Marines. They expect you to, you know, not back down, right? Yeah. And there's the balance too, you know, when people come up, you know, like a lot of little kids, a lot of the kids come up and they want to, you know, try to practice their English and they'll ask for pencils and money and chocolate and stuff like that. It's like, yeah, cool kid. And then after, you know, about 10 minutes, the same kid asking for chocolate and pencils and money, you're like, all right, dude, get out of here. You kind of just, you know, move them away from you and you, you continue about your business. Uh, you got to have that balance because again, very different type of warfare what is it like dealing with the civilians you bring up the kids knowing full well that they might be the enemy combat shooting at you an hour later well the biggest thing with the kids is they they will come up and try to take stuff out of your pockets um uh, the first real interaction that I had was in Baghdad. Up to Baghdad, we were usually had some kind of standoff from any civilian populace, either because we were just rolling right past them on the Amtraks, or they would just naturally keep their distance. But once we were in Baghdad, we were, you know, patrolling down city streets, and they were coming out, and they wanted to greet the Americans, and everyone was pretty friendly. But straight away, the first kid that came up to me uh, tried to reach and take something out of my cargo pocket. Mm -hmm. And so I called, I was like, Hey, watch out for these kids. You know, you already tried to take something out of my pocket. Um, so we learned pretty quickly to kind of keep them at distance. Uh, you know, we wanted to be nice. We tried start throwing candy to them and then you just get like swarmed, uh, by kids, you know, to get candy. Uh, and then moving forward, you know, I was, cause I deployed three times to OIF and, uh, the people kind of, they learn. And so they figured out that like they can get in your face and they can yell and, you know, express what I would presume is their displeasure that they're in your, my face yelling, but they realize there's not a whole lot that I can do about it. Cause they're like, well, he can't use that gun because I don't have a gun. So he's not going to shoot me. But you know, then someone just breaks that threshold of your space and you, you know, give them a good stiff arm into the chest and knock them backwards or you pick up a stick. They're like, okay, he's going to hit me with that. Like he'll, so I'm going to, I'm going to back away now. Um, we had issues. The kids were not only picking our pockets uh, on my last tour, but they started throwing rocks. Mm. And uh, so, you know, we were like, well, how do we, 
how do we solve this problem? Because they're throwing rocks and, you know, a rock isn't necessarily lethal. And, you know, no matter what, you know, anyone's personal opinion is or like, there's no way in hell, you know, it's would ever be okay to shoot one of these kids for throwing a rock. And they, they don't hang around for you to walk over and uh, express your displeasure another way. So we had to start getting uh, creative and we started punishing the adults hmm. that were standing next to them. So they throw a rock and they'd run and the adult is standing there laughing at it. So you walk up to the adult and grab him by the scruff of his shirt and shake him a little bit. And then pretty soon the adults started punishing the kids for trying to throw rocks and they kind of cleaned up that situation. That's a clever idea. Now, talking about raids, um, and I don't want to get too much into specifics here, but I know this is a big part of uh, dealing with warfare in general. I mean, both, you know, repelling a raid and then also probably doing a raid. What, what advice could you give guys out there who are in the military who um, might be going downrange and having to actually pull off a raid? So the, the biggest thing is just going back to what I said before is you have to train and you have to be brilliant in the basics. Um, you can't sit there and be like, oh, well, you know, if we trained like this soft unit or that soft unit, uh, everything would be better and we'd be better. Like, if you can't handle training to whatever your basic mission is, you know, as an infantryman or as a, a, a forklift operator, like whatever it is, uh, you know, you wouldn't be able to handle training to a soft mission or dealing with soft training. So you have to have that brilliance in the basics. Um, you know, yep. I tell my students all the time, like there's, there's no such thing as like advanced marksmanship. There's, there's no such thing as advanced tactics. It's just having a brilliance in the basics and understanding the principles and just being able to apply them in more stressful or complicated situations. I would assume planning is a really important part of conducting a mission like that as well. Yeah. I mean, anything that we do, um, planning is a huge part of it. And you can always tell for the units that, that don't plan and don't rehearse, they don't perform. No mm -hmm. matter how good the individuals are, um, if the unit as a whole does not plan and does not rehearse, it's not going to go out well. Speaking of rehearsals and training, um, how much is live fire actually used in uh, Marine training? I mean, when I did tactical response, a couple of tactical response courses in um, Tennessee, it was all live fire. And I kept hearing how in the Marines, you guys actually don't do a whole, whole lot, um, you know, of that type of thing, small unit tactics with the live fire. Yeah, it's probably not as much as everyone would think. Um, there's a lot of administrative constraints to that. Um, there's only so many ranges and there's a lot of units. And then especially, you know, depending on the base that you're, you're stationed on, like out here in Camp Lejeune, if I'm on range A firing, say, 50 caliber machine guns, well, the surface danger zone, the, the ricochet uh, hazard from those rounds might actually shut down ranges, you know, B and C on my left and right. So there's three ranges being used up by one unit, um, which just makes it harder for other units to get in there. Mm -hmm. um, but the thing about live fire is it's, it's definitely great. It's definitely necessary. And um, every unit that I work with, I encourage them to do as much live fire as they possibly can with the ammunition allotment that their unit has. But a lot of the things we do, you don't need live fire. Um, I mean, just look at competition shooters. They spend a lot of time doing dry, just basic dry practice mm -hmm. uh, before even going out to the range or, or even in lieu of going to the range. So it's same thing for us when it comes to um, simple individual skills like weapons manipulation. Uh, we do a lot of dry practice. You go out to the field and you rehearse your tactics and you again and again and again and again for weeks at a time and then your unit, your company, your battalion, platoon will go to a range. And now that we have hopefully built that brilliance in the basics, we're well-rehearsed. We understand that, you know, if we get contact front 
and we're moving towards a contact, you know, what everyone's going to be doing as we conduct that battle drill. And then what happens if all of a sudden a flanking element pops up on our right flank? Like we've already rehearsed that contingency. And so we all know what's going to happen. So we've got good communication. And that way, while you're, while you're on the live fire range, instead of trying to figure all that stuff out, you can just focus on your marksmanship while you apply all the you know movement techniques and manipulations that you've practiced dry time and time again. Yeah, that makes complete sense. Um, now, talking about CQB, which is you know something that one of your specialties here, um, you mentioned about sim rounds and everything, but I would imagine going live fire in a kill house would really kind of pugger your asshole a little bit and give you a little bit more real world type of feel. Um, how important is going, you know, live fire in that close confined space uh, for getting used to going, you know, downrange overseas, so to speak? Oh, yeah, it's super important. Um, and just like everything else, so when we teach our courses and when I, if I ever go out and teach another <coughs> uh, unit, it's always start them dry and make sure everyone understands, you know, where they need to be moving to, how the door procedures are going to work, you know, digging corners, points of domination, sectors of fire. Uh, but then you got to put them live fire. And you'll see that'll, that'll slow guys way down um, going live fire. Is they'll, when they're dry, they'll start running into rooms and going way too fast and call it outrunning their headlights. Like mm. they're just moving faster than they can actually process the information in front of them. And you're like, dude, you need to slow down because you're not processing what you're seeing. And then you put them live and they slow way the hell down because no one wants to hurt one of their brothers. And, you know, if it's a, you know, an actual training course, like no one wants to get dropped for safety violations. So they'll slow way down and then they'll build up that confidence. Like, okay, everyone does know what's going on. We all understand our roles in every little scenario and they get faster and faster and faster and faster kind of on their own. So that's the way that you're really supposed to do CQB is start as slow as you possibly can and build up that speed. Generally, yeah. Um, you know, there's, there's different schools of thought on how to train it up. Um, but considering we deal with mostly uh, younger Marines, it's their first time training for close quarters battle, that probably their first deployment or maybe their second deployment. Uh, we start slow so they understand the footwork. And they understand angles because that's what – those are big parts of CQB. Um, and then we'll start telling them to speed it up. And after a while, we, we don't really have to tell them to speed it up overall. There might be like, hey, you know, get a little bit faster when you're at this point or, you know, try to be here sooner. Um, but once you kind of tell them – stop telling them, hey, slow down, hey, slow down – they just start going as fast as they can process. The only time that we'll ever try to slow anybody down, it's like you're out running your headlights, man. You, you ran all the way into this corner in the room and you didn't see anything and you shot one target once you were stationary because you finally saw it. Like you need to speed up your processing and you might want to move a couple of steps slower so you can actually see where you're going. Hmm. Now, how about one man CQB? I mean, is that something that's ever taught? No, this is something we teach. Um, you know, I've I've seen places that will teach one man CQB, and uh, back in two thousand six, uh, we were introduced to some tactics that are pretty similar to what we're teaching now, and it made it possible to do a one man entry into a room in a sense. Um, but that's never, you know, it's never, definitely never a situation you want to be in. Yeah. Um, and that's why we emphasize, uh, working in teams. So, you know, they go in and, um, again, still people will train like two man, uh, one and two man. Um, we tend to kind of just work the entire assault team. So from, from get go, they're putting the whole assault team into the space so they automatically just start getting used to working on each other and they rotate through all the positions in the stack uh, and we really emphasize sticking to that assault team every time um 
because like kind of going back, we talked about before with you're going to encounter people in there and the easy thing is to shoot people. That's easy. You just sights up, pull trigger, that threat goes down, you move on to the next one. The hard part is dealing with the living um, because they can still become combative uh, and unknown. This person is standing in the middle of the room has nothing in their hands at the moment, you know, could attempt to try to draw from concealment or may just try to go hands on with you. Uh, so you have to quickly be able to move onto that. But if you got two guys in a room or one guy goes into a room by himself and he's got two unarmed that need to be secured and there's a door to another room that he's got to cover down as well, he can't cover three, four things by himself. So that's why we emphasize bringing the whole team in. It's got to be a, both an adrenaline rush and also um, an overstimulation of the mind. The first time that you actually – go in somewhere and you know it's for real is the way to deal with that just slowing yourself down or are there some other mental hacks that we could be aware of no uh again you will fall to the level of your training um you will not rise to the occasion so the more that you have trained to conduct a room entry the more that you have done that force on force, we're like, I'm going to go in this room and there's going to be one or two other guys with paint rounds firing back at me and I need to do the right thing because I don't want to get hit. Um, the better prepared you will be for that situation. Mm. Uh, I expected every time I went through a door, I expected there to be you know, someone in that one corner I couldn't see. I expected to be a guy with a Kalashnikov who was just going to start dumping a mag at me as I moved through the door. So I always made sure that like I was moving to the most advantageous point of domination that I could pick up as I'm negotiating the doorway, um, digging my corners and just doing all the things I was trained to do and all the, the drills that my teammate ran us through again and again and again and again uh, so that I you know wouldn't get caught off guard. But it was more, I think for me at least, it was more about that. Like, I just don't want to get caught off guard. I don't want to be walking into bullets because the other guy is already prepared and I'm not. Uh, and then you just, you just keep, you rinse and repeat. You just keep going through doors and till the whole structure is being cleared and secured. And you're like, oh, okay, cool. I'm still here. Yeah. Like, what's next? Basically, keep going. You go on autopilot. You just do it, do it, do it. And eventually, you'll be done with it, right? Yeah, um, but it's definitely not a uh, like a you know going into the black or something like that where like you don't know what's going on. You you have to be tuned in. Um, you have like you have to be tuned. In. You have to see what's in front of you. Like mm -hmm. where's that door? You know where are the where's the lighting? Where are the shadows? Where should I be moving to? Uh, where are the hinges on that door? Because that tells me you know can I see the hinges? Can I not see the hinges? Where's the door open? So what's my best angle? To approach that door is it already open so what does that mean for me do I already see people through that open door you have to process all this information that's really what makes uh, so you can be difficult is how well can you process information because hmm. um, there are lots of guys I train on the range and they're really good shots and they look really good on the range but then when you put them in the house uh, all of a sudden they're shooting kind of falls off yeah, and they get, they get a lot slower because they have a harder time processing that target. Like, okay, they, they go in and you can see they're looking at a target and they're processing like, is that a shoot target? Where do I need to shoot that target? And then finally they start firing. Uh, and there are other guys who maybe, you know, they sometimes they don't look as good on the range and they're kind of meeting that minimum threshold for where their marksmanship needs to be but then they can maintain that going into the house. And even though they're you know, not the best shot, they're good enough and they can move and process faster mm. than that guy who just looks really good on the flat range. Now you bring up a great point about being able to process information quickly. And it really does seem like a, a big chess game with situational awareness involved and it's just a lot of adrenaline at the same point. It's, there's a lot to that. Now, when we're talking about things like 
we had to contact like out in the field moving in a wedge or something like that is there as much thinking in that or is it more kind of reaction so uh initially it's it's a reaction um and like i you know when i taught students at the base recon courses like you know immediate action drill is really just to get you through the first 30 to 60 seconds of a contact it's you go into a lizard brain and you're performing all those actions that you've drilled into your uh, synapses but then you have to come back and you have to start thinking because if you're just going to go forward or go backward you're not actually going to get anywhere mm. and meanwhile the enemy who's especially for us we operate in small units so the enemy is likely to be larger uh not as overwhelmed they're going to be thinking and figuring out how they're going to flank us envelop us um bring more forces to bear, you know, start hitting us with rockets or IDF. So you have to start thinking and you have to start once again, seeing the battlefield in front of you and all around you. Um, so you can react appropriately and try to stay ahead of the enemy. That's the, the biggest thing. If you're reactionary only, um, then the enemy is, has that advantage. But if you can put them back on their heels and keep them reactionary, then even if your goal is to just break contact and get away, you still have the advantage because you're keeping them reacting instead of letting you be the one forced to react. Thusly, you'd want to really be aggressive towards them um, at first while you were breaking contact and really kind of force them to put their heads down a little bit. Is that kind of what you're saying? or? Yeah, so uh, you know, a basic principle, uh, Marine Corps, and I'm sure you know, Army as well, is, is gain fire superiority. Uh, you make contact, whether you initiate, they initiate, or, you know, it's just one of those moments where you both see each other at the same time. It's gain fire superiority. Um, people have different thoughts on that. Some people are like, ah, oh, just, just mag dump, right? Just start throwing rounds out there uh, and we'll suppress. Um, and that, that can work against some people. Um, it wasn't super effective against the Taliban. You know, they weren't really concerned mm. about rounds that were near misses. Um, they're more concerned like, oh, I'm now I'm hit. This is bad. Uh, so, you, you know, you definitely want more accurate fire. That's one of the things I've always pushed for is like the best suppression is destruction. Mm. Uh, so if you can actually hit the target you're aiming for, um, but gain that fire superiority. And when you gain that fire superiority, that then kind of gives you the ability to take a breath, come back into out of lizard brain and back into, you know, fully cognitive, like, all right, where do we need to go? Um, you know, what is my distance? How big is the enemy? You know, all these factors and, uh, it can be a lot. And you, you teach, you take a class on it and a class will, like label, you know, 30 things that you're supposed to think about, uh, to decide how to react to that contact you don't have time for that. So that's where the, you have to drill that in and just run drilling again and again and again. So they're like, okay, yeah, that's like 50 ish meters. So I'm going to go into them or like, no, nah, that's like 200. So, you know, I'm going to bound away. And I know there's a hill over here to my left because I was paying attention as I was walking up. So we're going to bound over that hill, put the hill between us and them. They can't shoot at us through a hill. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I imagine the, the higher up in leadership that you get, um, I don't know if my terminology is correct here, but, you know, like ATL, TL, something like that, um, there's more and more and more moving parts, and there's more and more you have to think about. And it seems like there's also more and more you have to, like you just said, we were looking ahead of time and realized there's a hill over here that we can get behind. Whereas a grunt, like the low-level guy, he's more kind of – Yes, he's going along. He's supposed to be observing, but there's less for him to think about. Uh, yes and no. Um, ultimately, what that boils down to is how is the leadership mentoring that young crowd? Mm. Um, you know, a, a properly trained unit, you know, whether it be a recon team, an inf infantry squad, uh, you know, an admin section in the office somewhere in the rear, like, if you're training your people appropriately, they should be able to make pretty much the same level decisions that you are. Mm. Um, really, what it should really just come down to is the fact that, you know, 
I have more lived experience than a guy who's only been in for two years. So I'm going to be able to make faster, potentially smarter decisions than he will in a high stress situation. But he should still be trying to think at my level. Um, yeah, that makes complete sense. And, you know, I really think that the, the better the leadership, the more they'll, they'll try to mentor and teach. Whereas, you know, some guys, I think, I don't know what to say. Some guys are just in it to, to get through it or something like that, you know, but some guys really take the extra time um, to reach out and teach. Yeah. Um, and, you know, that's one of the things uh, that I've been trying to work at remedying, you know, just by doing what I can to set the example, uh, trying to help out the, the younger leaders uh, when I encounter them. And, um, you know, one of the things that I'm working with some people, you know, out there on social media, uh, trying to fight that culture of toxic leadership where guys just don't care. And because they don't care, they don't want anybody else to care because then they look bad and they're just more miserable. So misery loves company. Yeah. Um, really try and squash that, you know, as best I can. It can be difficult, you know, uh, being an instructor billet, um, cause I can't just, you know, step on the leadership of the unit. You know, it's kind of a, they're the customer and I am the service providing what they ask for. Uh, but we definitely do what we can, you know, to help mentor those leaders. Cause, uh, pretty much everybody within the training branch, we're all pretty senior. Uh, so we've got a lot we try to offer to all the students, whether they be recon, they be infantry. Uh, we get a lot of the enablers, you know, intel guys, radio guys, uh, explosive ordnance disposal, um, dog handlers. So like all these people from, you know, a lot of different MOSs uh, come to our courses and we get asked to go out and help teach uh, classes and events to other units. So to us, you know, it's all the same. Like you have to be thinking at that warfighter level and have that mentality uh, and then just get your experiences in so you can make better decisions faster. How do you like being an instructor? I mean, would you rather be going out there and, and staying in the, the fleet, so to speak, or would you, do you like what you're doing now? Oh, I would absolutely love to uh, be back overseas and, you know, kicking in doors and, you know, setting in height sites and delivering information and controlling supporting arms. Um, but, uh, I mean, the instructor gig is, is pretty nice. Um, you know, especially the way that, uh, our office runs, it's, it gives us time for family and stuff like that, which is always nice. Um, and for recon, like we, we have a saying of Jack of all trades, master of none. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of different things that we have to try and be good at uh, through the course of a deployment workup. But being you know, a CQB instructor, it's kind of nice. It just allows me to really just focus on that and really kind of hone that craft. Um, so that's, that's an interesting kind of facet to the job. Um, but yeah, if I, could be, if I could be back out there you know, hooking and jabbing, as we like to say, uh, I would definitely prefer that. Not I could do without going on, uh, going back on boat. Um, I've had enough sea time. Um, but you know, I don't want to necessarily, you know, turn guys off to that. But I've I've got my sea time in, so I'm good with that. If you just want to fly me over somewhere, <laughs> drop me off, let me go kick ass, I'm good with that. Yeah, I know what you mean. I, I was a merchant marine for a while, and uh, it, it gets a little bit exhausting, you know, just being out at sea for so long. Yeah. Um, I do want to touch on the, the maritime operations that you guys were doing, um, board and search and seizure. Am I correct that that's what that was? Uh, visit, board, search, and seizure, yeah. So it's got to be – I mean, I would imagine CQB on a ship is – almost even more hairy than doing it in a building it it can be depending on uh where you are within the vessel um so you were a merchant marine so you you know probably at one point saw like the engine room yeah you know and so like you're going down the engine room and there's just so many little nooks and crannies and those ladder wells are like almost vertical yeah 
and you can see through them. So, you know, if somebody's already down that deck below and they see you coming down, like they can just start shooting up your feet. You know, we have a saying like bad guys don't, aren't graded on marksmanship. So they can just send it. Yeah. And there's not a whole lot you can really do. You know, there are some things that we teach the guys to, to mitigate that and some tools that can be used, but, uh, it, it can get hairy pretty quickly. Um, and even despite that, there's, you know, we, all the time we have guys slip and fall, mm-hmm. bust themselves up going down the ladders, you know, um, I mean, everyone's wearing a helmet because everyone's busting their heads on, you know, low-hanging pipes and stuff like that, especially if the lights are out inside of space. Um, but the the principles remain the same. You know, everything that you do on land, it remains the same on a boat as far as, you know, working your angles, speed surprise, violence of action. Hmm. Now, um I just want to circle back real quick to Iraq and your time over there because I feel like it's so valuable for guys. And I know even in the military right now, you know, guys aren't necessarily going overseas like they were when you were first in. What is it? I mean, can you give us any advice for guys who either are thinking about joining uh, specifically the Marine Corps, but maybe like not so sure? I mean, it's an unstable world right now. What kind of advice could you give from some somebody who's been there multiple, multiple times to uh, to newer guys coming in the service these days? So anybody that wants to enter the service, I would say absolutely do it. Um, but the biggest thing is do your homework, do your research, uh, understand what it is you're going to be getting yourself into. Um, and I know that some recruiters will be a little upset when I say this, but you don't owe that recru- recruiter anything. Um, so if you walk in and you don't like what they're selling, you just walk out and, you know, you can go next door. If you don't like what the Marine recruiter is telling you, you go next door and talk to, you know, the Army recruiter or the Air Force recruiter um, and until you like, you know, what they're telling you. Uh, if you don't think you're getting a straight deal, you know, call somebody up. If you know someone who's in the service or Instagram. I mean, I've had – probably a half dozen or more guys since I started getting uh, into this whole Instagram thing, hit me up and be like, Hey, I'm thinking about joining or Hey, I'm in the Marines, but I want to go recon. Like, what do I do? Um, There's a lot of ways out there. You can figure out like what exactly are you getting into? Um, That way you're mentally prepared for it. Um, Because the, the people I've seen that fail, they, they don't really, mentally prepare themselves they just kind of walk into it blindly and then they're broadsided with the reality of this new world they put themselves in and they they do poorly so do your research know what you're getting yourself into um and then make sure that you know what you're planning on doing in the marines or army or whatever force is going to be something that aligns with what interests you don't don't go in and, you know, try to pick some super technical job. It's like, oh, I'll, I'll make six figures when I get out in four years. Just because you're going to make six figures, I mean, you're going to enjoy yeah. make six figures, you know. Um, make sure something aligns with your interests. And I would recommend also doing something that's going to be challenging. You know, if you're super smart into science and computers and you're like, oh, man, I want to go for cyber warfare. Why? You're already good at that. You already know how to do that. Hmm. Like, go for something else. Go for something that's new, that'll be challenging you. You'll learn some new skills, meet different kinds of people. Um, Because in every service, like, if you don't like the job you're in, you can actually change your job. Hmm. Um, It's going to take a few years. You know, you got to give uh, your unit some time to get some use out of you, but you, you can change your job, you know? I mean, that was, uh, that was fantastic advice. I don't think I've ever really heard somebody, uh, especially higher up, say that before about, hey, if, you know, if you're not getting straight dope, then go somewhere else and see what you can do. I think that's great advice, especially for guys and girls out there, younger guys and girls who are looking into this and saying, you know, look, it's a daunting task. It's not just, you know, a, a signature and, and willy-nilly a couple of weeks. It's four years of your life or even more potentially. So it's a, it's a serious decision. And I think that it's great that we've got guys out there like you um, 
being honest and, and being straightforward about it. Now, Blake, dude, um, can guys and girls hit you up on Instagram if they have any questions? Yeah, absolutely. And your Instagram is Blake Water. It is 0326. 0326. Yeah. So that's Blake Water, and I think that's a good name, by the way. Blake Water 0326. And uh, that's how you and I got hooked up. And I appreciate you taking time out to come talk to us today, man. Really appreciate it. Um, it's been fun. A lot of great information. And um, I definitely want to get with you and talk some more offline. I've got a couple of uh, cool ideas that, you know, I think that will be really fun. But um, until then, man, I, I just want to say, dude, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Yeah, absolutely. You know, hopefully uh... – you know, a lot of people out there listening and uh, hopefully I said some stuff that can help, you know, people out that are deciding to join the service or uh, younger guys and gals are already in um, and hit me up. You got questions. I'm always here to help. Outstanding guys. Uh, don't forget. It is Blakewater0326 on Instagram. And definitely I would contact him if you have any questions. Also throw those comments down below and I'll bring them to Blake if you have anything. And we'll get it done that way. Until next time, Mother Flowers, please remember that you are your first and last line of defense. And I will see you on the next Tactical Podcast. Cheers, guys.